Hi everyone, welcome back to Five Quote Shakespeare Hamlet. Today we're gonna to do Act Five, Scene One. What I do in this series is I first give you a nutshell overview of the important plot events of each scene, and then we dive deeply into the text of each scene and pull out five quotes that I think are really useful to help you understand the play's character and themes. Act Five, Scene One is the famous grave digger scene. It's actually quite interesting. There's, there's, uh, it, it's, it's hilarious, it's really funny, it's existentialistly dark as well. There's some beautiful, sad poetry in there, and it reveals a lot about Hamlet's narcissism. This is this is the great narcissism scene, I suppose we could call it. So if you remember, Hamlet is on his way back from England after his crazy adventures with the pirates, and I suppose walking from the docks up to the court, they he and Horatio wander through the nearby graveyard, and they encounter a grave digger, and he's bantering with his companions as he tends the graves, and the, 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 the jokes are really, really funny, but also tinged with, with, uh, with a lot of the darker themes of the play, as Shakespeare tends to do. Hamlet and Horatio arrive and they join in the banter, the dark, loaded banter. Hamlet learns one of the skulls is poor Yorick. That's that famous, uh, um, um, alas, poor Yorick. The court gesture from childhood and, of course, the existential musings ensue. Ophelia's funeral procession then arrives and Hamlet, from a distance, he sees the funeral procession arrive at the gravesite and that's where they're burying um, um, Ophelia, of course. Um, and distraught, Laertes throws himself onto, it, it's a really dramatic scene, he throws himself onto Ophelia's coffin and Hamlet sees this. And the narcissistic man-child, he bursts forth and claims his rights as the most aggrieved, aggrieved party. So he jumps down onto Ophelia's uh, coffin as well. Again, hyper dramatic, reveals a lot about Hamlet's character. We'll talk about that in just a second. He, Hamlet and, and Laertes fight, trying almost competing for the attention of everybody else. It's really, really childish. And Claudius and Laertes, after, after the fight is over, Claudius pulls Laertes aside and says, okay, we've, we've got our plan, right? We know what's going on. And that's where um, things proceed. Shakespeare's doing a lot in this scene. If you remember, uh, just in previous scenes, we, we, were, we, were, we were shown a very melancholy, tragically beautiful scene of Ophelia dying by drowning, her death by drowning. She's, she's, she's on this beautiful dress, is floating in the water, and she's surrounded by flowers. It's all quite melancholy, and, and, and our sympathies for Ophelia are running high. Boom! We're thrown into this scene where two grave diggers are tossing bones out of a hole in the ground, surrounded by dirt. They're all dirty and they're and they're and they're talking in a very crude way. So we had this image, this lovely image of the death of Ophelia, and now we see where she's going to end up. They're tossing skulls and bones out of a hole, and and the implication is, of course, that she's going to be one of these skulls in a few years. Um, it's quite tragic. They used to recycle uh, graves back in those days. That's 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 what's happening. They're getting they're preparing the grave for Ophelia. Um, uh, a bit of cultural background here. She's, she's there, there's the they're they're talking about whether or not she deserves a Christian burial because she drowned herself and drowning it was a sin. Um, now they are they are quite clever. One guy's quite clever. The other guy's a bit slow. But they're uneducated commoners. But as I said, they're not they're not they're not stupid. Actually, in fact, the first clown gives Hamlet a run for his money. So the first clown presents a riddle to the second clown. He says, he says, who builds stronger than a mason? a stonemason, who builds stronger than a shipwright or a carpenter. So of all of the trades, who builds a stronger edifice or who builds a stronger structure? And this, this, is, at, this is now we're at the end. The second clown wants to know the answer. And this guy says, when you were asked this question next, say a grave maker builds the strongest structure because the houses that he makes lasts until doomsday. Now, it's actually, it's actually quite clever. It's a great riddle. But it also introduces the dark note of, of, of the existential crisis that Hamlet has been going through and we have been going through together with Hamlet. So, so those are the kinds of jokes that you'll find in this scene. I can't go through all of them. And then Hamlet picks it up. Hamlet is outraged. He's outraged that the clown dares to joke while he's th tossing people's skulls out of a grave. He's, he says to Horatio, he says, has this fellow no feeling of his business that he sings at grave making? Horatio's wiser, and he says, custom, so habit, he does this every day, custom hath made it, made it in him a property of easiness. So when you, go, when you grow accustomed to something, it's not such a big deal. Hamlet replies in a very wise way. He says, tis even so, the hand of little employment hath a daintier sense, has the daintier sense. Uh, this is, these are quite wise words. Uh, Hamlet's a spoiled boy. Um, he is. He, he has the luxury of, of spending his time gazing into gazing you know poetically and melancholically into the skulls of people meanwhile the rest of the world has to go about doing doing the work um, 
Yeah, it, 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 it reveals in him a self-awareness that he knows that he's spoiled, that he knows that he has the great luxury to sit here and muse on poetic musings. Um, meanwhile, the rest of the, the world has to, has, to, has to work, has to toil, and has to do unpleasant things like unclogging toilets, you know, while, while the prince can, can go off with his books. Uh, he's aware of himself as the spoiled overthinker, as, a, as, as, a, as an overly sensitive, um, um, uh, pampered boy, perhaps. I think there's maybe a little bit of shame in here, a little bit of self-hating. That's probably a bit too strong, but it, it does. It, it shows his intelligence. It shows his fair thinking. I think. Um, yeah, we, we can't hate him. We, we, we can we can we can accuse him of being a spoiled uh, a spoiled boy, but at the same time, he's aware of it. So what do you do with that? I don't know. It's tough. Anyway, so the. The gravedigger is tossing these skulls out of the grave, and Hamlet, in his poetic mood, he imagines that all of these skulls are different, different types of people from the life that that we are aware of. Cain, not really. Cain is the is the world's, you know, in the Christian world, um, it's it's uh, it's the first murderer. So he imagines, well, this skull is that guy. The evil guys are in the grave. Here's a politician in the grave. Here's a courtier in the grave. Okay, here is a lawyer, and he ends with the lawyer. And there's quite a long rant here about lawyers. It's very clever. Hamlet's showing off his own cleverness in parallel with the grave digger, who's showing off his his uh, cleverness as well. Um, so that that kind of ends. That that kind of banter goes back and forth, and then we get the next important quote that reveals that Hamlet is a snob. Hamlet asks. What man dost thou dig for? The clown says, for no man, sir. What woman then? For none, neither. Who is to be buried in it? So Hamlet's losing his patience here, but the clown is having a really, really good time. And the clown responds, one that was a woman, sir, but rest her soul, she's dead. So he's an equivocator. He says one thing, but suggests another thing. He, he, he speaks from both sides of his mouth at the same time, teasing Hamlet, of course. Um, we know, of course, that this is Ophelia that, that he's talking about. So again, our emotions are torn. We're laughing and chuckling at the clowns taking the piss out of Hamlet, but at the same time, um, we're, we're feeling for, uh, for Ophelia. Now, this next little bit uh, is interesting. It reveals, again, something of the complexity of Hamlet. Uh, we do like Hamlet. I've been trying to, trying to convey that throughout my series here. We do like him. We sympathize with him. We see parts of of, of, of him in us, okay? But at the same time, we have to be honest and we have to realize that there's things about Hamlet that are, that are actually not admirable at all. And this is one of them. Uh, so the, the, the clown is, the, the clown is having a joke at Hamlet's expense and he doesn't like it very much. He says, by the Lord of Horatio, uh, this three years I have taken note of it. The age is grown so picked with, that the toe of the peasant comes so near the heel of the courtier, he galls his kibe. So the image here is of, he's noticing that the age, in this age of democratization, I don't, I don't, I don't think so, but the, the peasant class is, is getting kind of uppity, too uppity for Hamlet's tastes, so that the peasants are, are walking so closely to the, closely behind the courtiers, to the, to the aristocratic class, that the heels of one are touching the toes of the other. Um, he doesn't like it. He doesn't like it, and 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 there's there's more evidence in the play to suggest this kind of uh, snobbishness. Uh, we've seen it when he was dealing, uh, when he was giving advice to the players and saying that um, you know don't don't give too much rein to the clowns because they're just they're just a bunch of hams. So again, Hamlet's complexity. One interesting little note I like to point out before we move on: um, How long hast thou been a grave maker? Asks Hamlet, and the response is, I came to it that day. Our last king, Hamlet, overcame Fortinbras. Now, the, the purpose for this is a, it's, it's a structuring technique for storytelling. Remember, we're heading towards the, 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 the conquering of Denmark by Fortinbras. We were introduced to the conflict between Norway and Denmark at the very beginning of the play, and now we get it somewhere near the middle. We get this signpost in this kind of foreshadow, actually a little bit closer to the end. Yeah, so things are ramping up, and we're getting pretty close to the end, and we have to be reminded of what's going on. Structuring technique, um, storytelling. You have there, there are mechanics to storytelling that have to be. You have to know what your audience needs to know at certain times if you're a good storyteller. Um, okay, so let's. So there's, there's lots more banter here. It's actually quite. It's funny and it's amusing, and it gets. It takes a serious turn around here. So so the first clown. Again, he, he picks up another skull, and remember Hamlet was rolling through the possibilities of all the different skulls, and this skull actually hits close to home. Forget the politician and the courtier, this particular skull was uh, Yorick's. 
it was the king's gesture. Let me see. So he takes the skull. And this is where things get really serious in, in the movies and in the plays because Hamlet sees a, a childhood friend that he loved dearly. Alas, poor York. I knew him, Horatio, a fellow of infinite jest, of most excellent fancy. Lovely poetry. There's lovely poetry here. We want to hate Hamlet. We want to hate him from his snobbery and his indecisiveness and all of these other awful quality, qualities. And then he comes up with these beautiful lines that really tug at our sense of, of, of shared humanity. Um, it's lovely stuff. This, these, this is the great existential scene. So he, 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 it's, it's quite easy to understand. You can, you can have a look at it. Go watch one of the movies and you'll, you'll get it. You'll get it. He's remembering his childhood that is now dead. York being the symbol of his childhood and how all of our childhoods pass away, the passing of time, one of the great themes. His narcissism kicks in a little bit again. However, as much as we want to love him for that, those particular sentiments that help us understand what it is to be human, his, his narcissism makes, makes a comeback. And then he imagines Alexander. And the Alexander the Great was the great uh, 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 gr Greek a Macedonian conqueror of, of much of the known world at the time. So he was revered in, in uh, throughout Europe for many, many years for, for, his, for his greatness. So a symbol of greatness, like Napoleon kind of guy. Um, so he says, Hamlet says to Horatio, to what base uses may, we may return? To what low, low uses we may return, Horatio? Why may not imagination trace the noble dust of Alexander till he find it stopping the bunghole? So a big beer barrel, you know, this plug, this cork, earthen plug that that plugs up a beer barrel couldn't the atoms of alexander end up in you know plugging up a, a, a beer barrel and this gross word bunghole this is fantastic too to, to emphasize the, the 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 contrast the the shocking outrageous contrast between this man who conquered the world and now he's plugging a, a beer barrel as a as a bunghole a uh, great existential thought Hamlet, the sensitive idealist, the all-or-nothing thinker, he can't stand it. It's almost like he's outraged. I, I added the word snobbery here, too. It's a kind of snobbery against nature. It's like, how dare nature? By implication, Hamlet, who should be king, not, not the, and, and again, he, he, he sees himself as a wannabe Alexander. He knows that he's not. He says, I'm not, I am no, I am no Hercules for sure. There's a kind of snobbery here. How dare the universe bring me to this end maybe it's good enough for these commoners but how dare they bring us great aristocrats to the same ends it is it is he's appalled by nature i think that's that's true um so there, there there's a narcissism in, built into that as well at the same time it's beautiful it's the great existential question it's the great sisyphean questions which is what why do we struggle Alexander struggled his entire short life to conquer the world, and even then he ends up here, the great, great question. We can also add to that the theme of the mind-body body duality, as I said, the inevitable corruption of the, of the flesh, the outrage that my flesh shall disappear, the outrage of that. Hamlet is the all-or-nothing thinker. He wants to live in pure spirit. He can't stand. He hates having a body because the body corrupts. They're throwing skulls out of a mud hole. That's what your body becomes. That's the corruption that the body becomes, and he can't stand it. He can't stand it. Poor guy. Uh, Horatio, again, he is our great Benvolio. He is the lovely, rational foil to our irrational, erratic, uh, always engaging hero. And he replies, to or to consider too curiously, to consider so. Okay, so those, those, are, that's, that's, those are the words of the rational, ideal man. It's the theme of thought versus action. It's the theme more so of overthinking and thinking too much that can drive us crazy. Now, is Horatio one of the lucky ones that isn't burdened with, with, this, with, with a hyper-intelligence, perhaps, and with a sensitivity that doesn't help the intelligence? If you get super-intelligence but you're sensitive at the same time, that's going to cause you some mental problems because you you see everything and you see the pain in everything and because you're sensitive that hurts you and i think i think those kinds of guys have the hardest time of it whereas you can be hyper intelligent but sociopathic like claudius he's really smart we've seen in the last couple of scenes that he's super intelligent he knows how to manipulate people but he doesn't have the sensitivity that hamlet has so yeah lots going on here um yeah horatio the ideal foil there it is Hamlet's philosophical musings peter out 
somewhat, and he ends with the same argument that he had before. He, he mentioned uh, when he was teasing Claudius about how the king can go through the guts of a beggar via the worm and the fish. Well, it's the same thing here. He imagines uh, Alexander and imperious Caesar going, uh, um, becoming bungholes. Um, then then the, the, the king and the queen enter with Laertes and their bear and, and, and Ophelia's corpse. And shortly, Hamlet's going to go off the rails. But before that, there's a few, uh, few things of note. Um, Hamlet talking to Horatio on the side. They're watching the procession. Nobody sees them yet. Hamlet um, recognizes Laertes, and he says that that is Laertes, a very noble youth. There's Hamlet's uh, naivete, perhaps, uh, his fair thinking, honest and generous minded. He, he, he's an honest guy, you see. Just when you want to hate him, you can't because he does something um, fairly noble. The priest comes in and he says a few words. Laertes, must there be no more done? Laertes is upset because the priest can't give Ophelia all of the proper Christian burial rites, but uh, no more must be done. So that's, that adds to the tragedy, I suppose. I don't know what else that would be doing in the play, except for add, adding to the sense of tragedy. Now, this is really curious here. Gertrude says, again, this is among the last words that Gertrude says before she dies at the end. I hoped thou shouldst have been Hamlet's wife she's saying as she scatters flowers on Ophelia's grave. Now, that's really, really interesting, and, and I don't quite know what to make of it, to be honest. Uh, there's a parental interference hint here, the meddling theme, the obscurities and tricks in the world, all of that stuff that we heard at the beginning of the play about Hamlet being out of Ophelia's star. He's too high for her. He's too noble for her. They wouldn't be able to marry. Was that nonsense? Was there, was there an opportunity for them to get married and just other forces, the tricks in the world, were conniving against them? I really don't know. Or is Gertrude completely out of touch? I really don't know. It, it's, 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 uh, if we want to ask ourselves why Shakespeare makes everything so obscure like that, uh, I'll repeat what I've said in previous videos. It's because life is obscure. We really don't know what our motivations are. And we really don't know what we don't know. And we don't know what the other people that we hope would know something like our moms would know. Um, it's, it's, it's really confusing, but it, I think it, it's true to life. It really is true to life, a play like this. Anyway, so there's a great question. Dig into that. You want to make an essay out of that? It'd be very, very, very interesting. Um, so, oh, noble woe, oh, noble woe. Laertes leaps in on the, uh, on, onto Ophelia's grave. Again, hyper, hyper dramatic, overly dramatic, melodramatic. But remember, I mentioned in a previous video that everything on the stage must be grander and bigger than everything in real life. Otherwise, it's not a drama. That's the definition of a drama. Okay, here's where Hamlet really goes off the rails. What is he whose grief bears such an emphasis, whose phrase of sorrow conjures the wandering stars and makes them stand like wonder-wounded hearers? This is I, Hamlet the Dane. Well, there's narcissism for you. He sees Laertes getting everyone's attention in his grief and exaggerated grief perhaps hyperbolic grief when he leaps into the grave of his sister which is yeah it's pretty pretty darn dramatic so he sees he sees laertes um gathering everyone's attention like that he can't stand it he jumps in because he needs that attention that's what the narcissist does i've said i've said this many times in this series that's what the narcissist does something happens to somebody else they immediately turn attention to themselves in some manner and this is one hell of a manner let me tell you histrionic a person who needs all the attention an immature man child there's no real thought of of ophelia here he doesn't go he doesn't cr he doesn't crash to his knees and, and and weep ophelia 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 he doesn't do that it's this is i hamlet the dane that that's an assertion of his right as the, as as a king as well by the way there's there's a there's a suggestion of that there too so definitely narcissistic histrionic they start to fight they grapple uh he says i loved ophelia again it's it's not he doesn't lead with the name ophelia he leads with himself i loved ophelia Forty thousand brothers there's my counterpart on the two sides me versus the brothers it's had nothing to do with ophelia she's squashed in the middle here horrible horrible 4,000 brothers could not, with all their quantity of love, make up my sum. Look at the, look at the, look at the pronouns there. What will you, thou do for her? Do you see? It's all about what he can do. Um, what he can do for, for what, what he should have done or should be doing with Ophelia, which he didn't do because he, 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 he showed her the door in no uncertain terms. Everyone thinks he's crazy. Uh, he continues crazy. What would you do? Would you weep? Would you eat a crocodile for her? I'll do it. I'll do anything. Well, there's ironic, as we know, Hamlet doesn't do anything, but there he is. Dost thou come here to whine, to outface me with leaping in her grave? So again, it's the same thing. It's all about me, me, me. And by now, Ophelia has disappeared, and we don't see much of her at all. 
Uh, strange, really, really strange. Now down here is another bit of strangeness here. He says, hear you, sir. So he, he, he turns to Laertes, who's, who's throttling him, quite literally, to Laertes that has him by the throat, and they're fighting in that manner. And then when they shake, you know, when they're pulled apart and they're, they're huffing and puffing and calming down a little bit, Hamlet says, hear you, sir. What is the reason that you use me thus? I loved you ever. Now he's actually wounded. Hamlet actually is wounded here. He doesn't understand why Laertes hates him, because we saw earlier that Hamlet actually said a few good words about about Laertes. He actually admires Laertes. So he's he's actually, he's curious. Now, because Hamlet doesn't know that Laertes has plotted to kill Hamlet, and, and Laertes would love to kill Hamlet on the spot here, but he but but he doesn't. He's pulled away. So so perhaps the, the yeah, Laertes should be upset that Hamlet has interrupted Ophelia's uh, um, uh, uh, funeral in such a way. Fine. But but also, Laertes wants to kill Hamlet, so he probably overdoes it, and that kind of shocks Hamlet. Says, "Whoa, man, where did this come from?" So I think that's 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 what's happening there. Hamlet ends. He, he, they, they all they shake it, they shake themselves off free from each other, and Hamlet shakes off the moment, and he says, "But no matter." So there's there's a bit of resignation entering a resigna a, resign a, a tone of resignation entering into his in, into his speech. Here he says, "Let Hercules do what he's may, would do what he may. The cat will mew, and the dog will have his day." Her Hercules can't prevent a cat from being a cat, and every dog will get what he wants eventually. So there's there's a note of fatalism here when 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 he ends and then he exits. And to wrap things up, Claudius then takes um, uh, her, uh, takes Laertes aside and he says, "Strengthen your practice in our last night's speech." So that's again that that's he says that more to more for the benefit of the audience. The audience. Laertes doesn't need to be reminded that they have a plan to kill Hamlet because he almost just killed him right now. But then, but then uh, Claudius, uh, for the purposes of the audience, he says, we remember what's going to happen. It's like at the very, very end of the scene, that's what uh, a movie or something will do. It'll remind you of the next segment that's going to come up in the, uh, in the play or the movie. And then he says to Gertrude, yeah, we'll, we'll, build, we'll, we'll build a nice monument for, for, um, for Ophelia. And that's the end. And that was... Five Quote Shakespeare, Act 5, Scene 1. Come back for my next video, Act 5, Scene 2, the finale. Thanks for watching.